Thank you, Miner, for that introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here with you all, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us today for this important conversation. Um, like Miner mentioned, the center and our partners today are really excited that we're joined by experts who will be talking about their work in California, Louisiana, and North Carolina. Folks in the audience are also joining us from other states. Um, and as Miner also mentioned, our thoughts are with folks in states who are experiencing air quality and extreme poor air quality and extreme heat due to the wildfires um, in Canada. So first, um, I have a super serious question for you all. What do you call a virtual conversation between experts talking about increasing access to the benefits of renewable energy? I'll give you just a second to think about it. A so it's a solar panel. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy that. Um, feel free to feel free to recycle it. Um, and I would love to go on um, and just share some better ones that I have, but we have lots to cover today. Now, in all seriousness, I want to start by laying out a roadmap of how we'll spend this hour together. I'll provide just some brief context and framing for the conversation on the federal funding landscape and opportunities available to states. And I'll also identify some of the key players and stakeholders um, who are driving this work at the state level. Then I'll introduce our panel, our amazing panel of experts, and we'll learn about um, the dynamics and challenges they're confronting in their state work. Most importantly, we'll focus this conversation on the solutions that are needed to center social, economic, and racial justice in the clean energy transition. Centering justice in this transition is aspirational. It's a goal. The work involves ensuring that investments and benefits of renewable energy generation and the deployment of clean energy investments um, and the benefits um, reach, uh, are deployed and reach um, populations that are the most vulnerable. We're talking about the gen uh, regeneration of renewable energy, deployment of clean energy technologies, high road jobs in the clean energy industry, and ensuring that these reach low income and marginalized communities. These are the most vulnerable populations, including displaced fossil fuel workers, and especially low income, black, Latino, indigenous, and other people of color who are overburdened by fossil fuel pollution, climate impacts, and who have been historically underserved by federal and state investments. It's an exciting time for this conversation because we have in our hands a once in a lifetime opportunity to leverage federal investments and action for large scale and long term transformation. Today, we have um, advancing slides. Today, we have programs and funding available for state communities, state governments, communities, and individuals that we did not have even a year ago. This means that a lot has been going on at the federal level. Even for those of us following the actions of the administration and federal agencies closely, it's been hard to keep up. So let me just set the stage. Unfortunately, we don't have time to provide a full overview of these funding opportunities, but in this slide, we've summarized for you just some of the key initiatives and funding opportunities available to state governments. But there is also funding available to individuals, community-based organizations, businesses, and local governments. In summary, the IRA um, and the bipartisan infrastructure law will provide at least $370 billion to support clean energy, mainly in the form of tax credits. And this will leverage help leverage hundreds of billions more dollars from private investment. I encourage you to learn more about these funding opportunities um, and we will be providing after this webinar some amazing some links to some amazing resources that have been put together by other organizations um, and I encourage you to learn more there. Today our conversation will focus on uh, let me stop this. Uh, today our conversation however will focus at the state level where key actors including privately owned utilities public commissions who regulate them are playing a leading role in the transition to clean energy. The major players at the state level, like I mentioned, include uh, privately owned utilities and commissions, and also state agencies and offices who play an important role in designing and implementing programs. 
Other key players and stakeholders at the state level include independent administrators and installers who implement programs and install, install clean energy systems, train workers, also community-based organizations who are conducting direct, direct outreach to communities and households, property owners and developers, renters, farmers, local governments, schools, and conservationists. They all have important roles to play in accelerating, in accelerating the clean energy transition and in advancing equity and justice. With this backdrop, it's my pleasure to, in, to now introduce our amazing panel of experts. We are honored to be joined by experts and advocates who are leading efforts in their states to center equity as part of the clean energy transition. First, I want to introduce Alvaro Sanchez, who is a leading expert and advocate in California, where he has been extensively involved in shaping nearly $1 billion in California climate investments. Alvaro has led legislative advocacy and other efforts in the state to deliver benefits to priority communities. Alvaro is Vice President of Policy at the Green Lightning Institute. Thank you, Alvaro, for being with us. Our next panelist is Camille manning Broom, who is a prominent member of the Louisiana Climate Initiative Task Force. Camille is also Executive Director of the Louisiana-based Center for Planning and Excellence. Camille also serves on the board of directors for Smart Growth America and is a commissioner of the Capital Area Groundwater Conservation Board. Camille has co-authored um, co Louisiana's first ever coastal master plan. She's an expert and groundbreaking pioneer in climate adaptation, people first infrastructure and resident led community planning. Um, please join me in welcoming Camille. Um, and our third panelist, Ajulo Otho, is founder and CEO of Enerwealth Solutions and a board member of Black Owners of Social, Black Owners of Solar Services. Um, Ajulo is a recent awardee of a Department of Energy grant, and Ajulo also serves as a board member at the Center for Progressive Reform. Welcome to you all. So let's start by discussing how states can seize federal opportunities to center justice. This question is for all of you, um, and you will have an opportunity to all respond and provide opening remarks here. Can you please offer in your opening remarks some thoughts on what opportunities there are for centering justice? What opportunities do these federal funding opportunities offer in your state for centering justice? Especially with the priorities, with, with what the energy priorities are in your states and the challenges. Um, and let's start with. Alvaro. Thank you, Catalina. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, and um, yeah, what a moment. Um, today, uh, I want to really quickly highlight a huge, a huge decision that the Supreme Court just uh, landed on today that I think is going to create a huge challenge moving forward for centering justice in the way that we address climate um, energy at the transition. Um, today's court is, uh, you know, uh, basically struck down affirmative action uh, in college admissions. Um, and that is gonna ch have a chilling effect on how we go about bringing in climate justice, uh, because I think the interpretation of that law is going to be uh, expanded beyond college admissions particularly in states uh, that are already having a hard time, um, you know, focusing on equity strategies to bring in an energy transition. So I want to start with that challenge, because I think it's one that we all should be aware of, and we're going to have to navigate uh, moving forward uh, how to address that issue, uh, because we know here in California, uh, a state that has banned affirmative action for the last 20 years, uh, that it's difficult to sometimes achieve equity strategies when that's something that we have to contend with now. So now that's across the country and it's something that we should be paying attention to. Um, but there are other challenges. I mean, uh, just the fact that there are so many opportunities available within IRA, IIJA, and all of the other things that the federal government has done, it's almost too much. Uh, keeping track of all of it and making sure like how do we keep track of what opportunities are most available to us is fairly difficult. Uh, and that combined with an impossible timeline, there's a lot of prioritization around getting things done and getting things out the door, uh, means that there's just um, a, a lot of uh, information that we need to understand and we need to make sense of, but it's almost too much and it's hard to keep up, uh, particularly when it hits the state level, where it's a little bit harder to know how the state is going to implement the resources that are coming from a federal, uh, you know, federal programs. 
But there are some opportunities, and I think that these are really important. Um, Justice 40, the executive order, does provide a policy lever to be able to say we need to focus in on an energy transition that's equitable because of that executive order. And of course, CJS, the, plan, the mapping tool that was developed at the, at the White House, while it still needs uh, some improvements, it's a good tool to use to be able to say these communities are the ones that are really meaningful in, in terms of making sure that the investments are going to those communities. And there are discretionary programs like the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, like the Climate Justice Block Grant, Thriving Communities Programs. These discretionary funding opportunities create an opportunity to really kind of ex um, experiment and advance some really interesting climate justice uh, and, cl and clean energy uh, strategies that are rooted in community needs. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention is that uh, we have a great opportunity to lift up community-driven examples of how we do an equitable transition with these uh, resources, these tools, and these policy levers. Um, so we have, you know, a big tool available to us, resources to make a change. And now we have to focus in on how to lift up community voices to be able to make uh, the most transformational change possible. So I'll stop there and uh, pass it over to one of my fellow panelists. Thank you, Alvaro, for kicking us off there. Um, Ajulo, what are the opportunities, challenges for seizing the moment that we are in? Yeah, um, hi, thank you so much, Catalina and CPR. Um, I'll just kind of echo, I think that, um, you know, fundamentally what we're talking about in terms of equity is really about um, how the benefits of this technology accrue to everyday Americans, to workers, to families, um, what this technological shift actually means at the household level. And um, while the Inflation Reduction Act and then Justice 40 before it, um, now the, um, the introduction of the community benefit plans, um, the grants, the enhanced tax credits, all of the investments coming from the federal government tilt towards um, greater equity, certainly. Um, there's more of an emphasis on distributed generation. There's an emphasis on building integrated generation. Um, whether or not those resources are actually unleashed is um, highly dependent on what's happening at the state level. So this is a very important conversation to have. Um, and it's really patchwork across the country. Um, and often because the policymakers at the state, um, many, um, too many are captured by utilities. And that's sort of the case that we have here in, in North Carolina and in many of the Southeastern states that even though there is this tidal wave of potential, um, whether or not that potential and the benefits actually accrue to, to everyday people is in some ways constrained by our regulatory marketplace here. Nevertheless, there's a lot of innovation that's happening um, already within the marketplace and also with cities and states trying different um, approaches to sort of educate residents and, and at the same time create opportunity uh, programs, things like um, net metering at the state level, which is governed by the Utilities Commission, which is therefore governed by the, the uh, administrative um, state or, or, or as enabled by statute, um, those things still matter. Net metering matters. Um, whether we have a meaningful community solar program that is inherently a more equitable type of way of deploying this technology, it's available to folks who don't have rooftop um, space, to folks who can't afford to buy a system up front. Um, whether there are such programs available is really dependent at, on the state policy. And so while the marketplace may be trying to figure out ways to tap into these resources, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done around advocacy at the utilities commissions and in the state legislatures. Thank you so much, Ajula, for adding that perspective. Um, and last but not least, Camille, please offer us your opening remarks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, just to, to, to build off, and I uh, agree so much with the other panelists, and, um, you know, in Louisiana, we really are at the center of it all because we have been on the front lines of climate change impacts over the past 20 years, really feeling the burden and heavy lift of 
uh, concurrent disasters and, and this uh, cycle of uh, disaster recovery um, that, that you know, we just can't get out of. Um, and when prior to the BIL and IRA passing, um, we had a, a very heavy lift and strong effort led by our governor and the state um, to approve the first Gulf South's uh, statewide climate action plan. Um, and because Louisiana produces, we are the fourth highest greenhouse gas emission per capita in the United States. 66% uh, of our emissions come from industry. Um, our approach to this is going to, going to be highly complex and, um, and it's, it's going to have to focus on doing things a completely different way than we've done them in the past, which uh, presents the, the biggest challenge because we have to uh, learn unlearn and relearn entirely new systems of thinking, operating, uh, and centering justice and equity has not been part of the status quo or any processes or uh, governance structures in the past. Um, and so we have quite the challenge ahead of us. Um, we, we have oper lots of opportunity within the BIL and the IRA but we do need to recognize that the incentives in those resources highly favor um, also exacerbating the, set, the status quo. Um, and so we're going to have to push from a number of different angles. And again, that it's that unlearning and relearning uh, in our, our governance and processes systems that we're gonna have to, to focus on. And so one way that we have been supporting the state and the governor in doing that is uh, we conducted a series of workshops with the governor and the cabinet um, to really prioritize and strategize the state's um, priorities for in response to the BIL and the IRA getting our state um, organized and um, uh, you know aligned and how it was going to approach the resources, how, what it was going to prioritize and, and have a common plan uh, across the all the state agencies. Uh, even you know recognizing the need to uh, prioritize funding to go toward local municipalities uh, for matches and such. And so, um, we, we, Center for Planning Excellence was fortunate enough to uh, facilitate and lead those series of workshops with our governor and state agencies so that they have a plan and are putting a, a um, highly collaborative and uh, coordinated approach forward in, in the response. Uh, and, and I'll say that in those workshops, we did have to, um, and there's more work needed here, um, really walk through exercises of how you even center equity and justice and project design. Uh, th this, is this is not something that's integrated culturally into any decision-making process um, at the government levels. And so this, this all has to be um, new structures and, and learning systems have, have to be put in place for decision-making to actually center equity and justice. Um, and so I'll just add that to my other two panelists comments. Um, thank, yeah, thank you so much, all of you for setting setting us up so well um, for this conversation. I want to move on to our next question and dig more into the dynamics that you're confronting in your states. Um, however, before I do, I just want to take a quick moment, a quick pause here, um, and we're going to drop a link with you all in the chat. Um, and I'm just going to introduce our California Climate um, Justice Index, um, which is part of the California Climate Justice Project that the center has been working on. Um, also, just to provide um, the, a framing that I think is, is useful um, to think about, to, to map out all of the players um, that are involved in this at the state. Um, so feel free to check out the link. Um, the Climate Justice Index is one is just one piece of the Center's California Climate Justice Project, which is really an attempt to demystify um, and make more accessible the complex web of guiding legislation, high-level plans, identifying the responsible agencies, 
identifying the funding processes and laying out the programs for folks in California and in other states. Um, this tool is really intended as a resource for advocates and decision makers in California who work on so many different pieces of, of this work that often become siloed, um, and also for people in other states beyond California to understand um, what has California done, how have they done it, um, and start to get a sense of how those pieces are coming together, and also to understand that Cal although California has, has had a bit of a head start, we certainly do not have everything figured out. Certainly everything is not playing out as, you know, as equitably as it could be. Um, and so the goal of this index is really to increase transparency of the state's governance structure and start to shed some more light on where decision making takes place um, and what the, the structure is. Um, through this, through the California Climate Justice Project, um, I just want to mention some of the main uh, points of some of the main topics, research topics we're covering in the project. So we're looking at climate action planning, the role that environmental justice has played and at times not played in the state's statewide climate planning effort. Um, we're looking specifically at funding programs and specifically the mechanisms through which those programs are being deployed out to communities and to households um, and, how, and particularly how they're reaching priority populations. Um, and what California has create, has identified as disadvantaged communities, according to Cal Bioscreen. Um, and so through this work and through extensive and in-depth interviews with folks at state agencies, state level advocates like Alvaro and community-based um, leaders, we're also um, learning about cross-agency coordination and initiatives and um, official and unofficial strategies that are being developed in California to have a more holistic and integrated approach across state agencies. Um, so those are the topics of the, of the project. And in the index, um, if you look through it, you will find um, this we will find this map to the comprehensive statewide planning process, the scoping plan, which will be which is described in detail. You'll also find all of the, the key agencies that are implementing California's climate justice work. Um, you'll find detailed diagrams of how they're how these or how these um, large agencies are structured. Um, and then in the in the coming months, um, in the sorry, in the coming weeks um, and months, um, I also encourage you to go back to the index and you'll find um, detailed information about the funding programs in California, um, their features and what what mechanisms um, they're primarily relying on. Um, and some of this information in the coming weeks um, will also be made available um, in Spanish. Um, so the idea for this index was developed just from conversations we had with folks who said that something like this would be helpful to move things forward in California and to help share information in other states. And our hope really is that this framework will add transparency and enable advocates um, to, to, to advocate effectively and will allow people to have access to decision-making processes and spaces that they, they haven't had access a lot of access to um, in the future. And so I encourage you to check it out, um, send us feedback on it. And I also want to uh, take a moment to recognize and give a huge shout out to Professor um, at University of San Francisco School of Law, Alice Caswan, who is a, a longtime member, scholar member of the center, um, who really helped kick off this work at the center and is continuing to carry this work forward. Um, great. So thank you all for that. Um, and now I do want to delve into um, the roles that states are playing and specifically the dynamics in there. So again, this question is for everyone to respond to. Um, and specifically, I'm if you could respond to um, or offer some thoughts on what roles are state legislatures, um, utility commissions, agencies, advocates, what roles are all of these folks playing in accelerating the clean energy transition? And what justice principles um, and equity considerations um, are being factored in? And we'll start this time uh, with Camille. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I should note that um, there are a lot of definitions on clean energy, and so I'll just read to you real quickly the one that um, Louisiana is using in our Climate Action Plan. 
Um, energy generated from non-renewable sources with little to zero greenhouse gases includes, but is not limited, limited to nuclear bio waste and natural gas with carbon capture. And so um, I just, you know, want to highlight because, um, you know, as you ask about clean energy, um, my organization, we are very much focused on renewable energy expansion because there is a gap and need for um, um, public policy and leadership specifically around renewable energy because we are in a state that doesn't have any. <laughs> um, and so one, um, when you think about the actors, I would say I'm, I'm very proud of our administration for bringing all sectors together for a robust um, public discussion and, and the development of our climate action plan, uh, which, which you know, included uh, participants from each sector and, and points of view. Uh, and, and our climate action plan prioritizes the only way we're gonna get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, which is the goal, uh, are around these three pillars to increase our renewable electricity output, uh, shift our industrial processes to electric power instead of fuels, and then um, industrial fuel switching to low and no carbon hydrogen. Um, outlined in our plan, there are a multitude of policies, programs, and, and leadership that's gonna be required um, by, by legislators, by government agencies, by the public service uh, commission, utility partners, industry partners, academics, everyone. And so we've, 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 kind of, we've laid out that roadmap. Um, I think that what's most critical to note is that we all have to be ready to um, understand that the way that um, power and um, the, the proceeds of power generation um, have, and, and the jobs around that um, have left a huge portion of our population um, out of, of that market and uh, those proceeds in the past. And so this requires us to do something completely differently. So even when oil and gas was its strongest, um, our, our population was left behind as you know, private companies reaped all the benefits. And so you know, we, are, we are the second highest in the country um, of um, the highest poverty rate, second highest in the country. And that attests to our unequal distribution of resources and opportunity for the people who need it most. And so um, our climate plan is explicit about creating a more uh, inclusive, equitable, and resilient economy for all Louisianians, but it will not happen overnight, and it's going to require a lot of intentionality um, and uh, new ways of thinking and new agreements and doing things completely differently. And so in order to get that, we need an all-hands-on-deck approach uh, from all actors participating in this conversation and, and um being part of how we shape the future and, and whatever this transition is gonna look like. And so um, I'll just uh, leave it there for my other panelists. Thank you so much. And um, we can go to Alvaro. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, so I, I work and live in California. Um, and I know California is, you know, fairly unique when it comes to how our whole, you know, government infrastructure, even our utility infrastructure is moving towards advancing clean energy strategies. So I think for the most part, um, they're playing a helpful role uh, in doing this with some glaring uh, discrepancies and some, uh, you know, uh, some things that don't quite align towards that, um, towards that ambition. So here in the state of California, I think uh, over the last several years, um, I've been working in this role for the last nine years. Uh, and I think since I started, uh, one year after the next has been upping the ante on climate policy, more aggressive goals, more funding, faster timelines. Uh, and it feels good to be in a state that's doing that kind of work and that, you know, um, you know at that speed. Um, and 
from time to time, there are definitely some uh, things that come up that uh, make you scratch your head because you're like, well, we took three steps forward and now we're taking a couple back uh, on some of the decisions that, that we end up making. Um, but I think for the most part, um, you know, uh, the state is taking this uh, issue really seriously. Um, you know, at one point in lack of federal, uh, you know, uh, advancing federal strategies around climate, California really tried to step in and kind of be the torchbearer for the country around these issues. Uh, so I think that that just means that we're trying to do the work. Um, but, um, you know, we still have a lot of room to grow on all issues, but particularly when it comes to climate justice and achieving a just transition. Um, I think we're much better. At talking about equity than about make and about making big promises than we are around delivering meaningful, equitable, concrete outcomes. And I think that that's the next step for us. Um, if we are going to be really serious about achieving a just transition, about making sure that every part of California uh, is seen and, and feels like they are part of the solution um, and that they benefit from all these um, you know, ambitious climate policies, we really have to deliver. And just in our last um, you know, budget that we just approved uh, this week, um, unfortunately, a lot of core equity strategies were not funded, um, you know, whereas a lot of more mainstream uh, energy strategies are. So I think that we have to really take a close look in the mirror and say, are we living up to the words that we, that we are saying uh, and the promise that we are you know, um, you know, sharing with the world around how we want to achieve a just uh, transition to a clean energy future? Um, but we do have some tools available to us uh, that uh, you know, we need to use more. So for the last 10 years, we've been targeting funding to disadvantaged communities via uh, our cap and trade resources. Um, but we use cap and trade as the source for uh, those resources that are coming up. So that's creating still hotspots in places that are already overburdened by poverty and pollution. Um, we do have some great programs that are really kind of bottom up approaches to climate action. Uh, and those are great. But those are the same ones that didn't get funding in this last funding uh, uh, budget cycle. Um, we require certain things around our climate justice programs that I think are really interesting and really innovative, like collaborative governance structures between local community members and local governments that are pursuing uh, you know, multi-million dollar grants for sustainability. Um, we have uh, required strategies within climate justice programs that require funding of anti-displacement strategies, for example, uh, which I think is really unique and really important uh, as we're thinking about how do we transition certain communities, improve them, but then run the risk of those communities being open for gentrification and displacement because there are now better places to live. Uh, you know, there's a coined term here in, in Oakland called uh, we want better neighbor, we want better neighborhoods, same neighbors. And I think that that's the spirit around, you know, these funded strategies for anti displacement placement. Um, and we're really prioritizing capacity building and technical assistance, particularly to those places that need it the most. This is an issue that I want to connect back to the federal opportunities that we have right now. It's great that there's all these federal opportunities. They're really complex. They're really difficult to access. Uh, it's going to be hard for a lot of folks to be able to gain access to these resources, particularly those that lack capacity and technical, technical know-how on how to pursue these resources. Uh, so for the last several years in California, they've been prioritizing these issues. Um, and in fact, that's one of the programs that did, in fact, get some resources in this in last budget cycle. Um, and I think that that's a testament to the acknowledgement that some of our communities need a lot more help in order to be able to take advantage of the available policies and resources that are out there for advancing climate justice. So the picture here looks okay. I'm glad to work here because it makes my job a lot, uh, a lot easier. Um, but we still have a lot, a, a lot of room to grow. And if California is going to be really uh, wants to be seen mm -hmm. as the national leader around achieving these issues, uh, we really better, uh, really kind of, you know, put. Um, put our money where our mouth is when it comes to delivering on equitable outcome, uh, because I don't think we're quite there just yet. Thank you so much. So in the interest of time, um, I do want to be able to take at least a couple of questions from the audience. So I'm going to move now to a question directly to you, Ajulo. Um, this is something I've learned a lot from you. I've heard you talk about, you know, this amazing fact that North Carolina actually ranks fourth in the nation in solar power generation. It's an installing um, and an installed solar capacity. So it's just it's right behind California, Florida, Texas. Um, in in twenty in twenty twenty one, I think something like fifteen percent of the state's generation was produced by re from renewable sources. Um, and this this sounds great. Um, in North Carolina, has some new state laws, um, has ambitious plans to reduce emissions from the power sector by seventy percent by twenty thirty. 
Um, so on paper, this looks great, but how has equity actually factored in utility and public utility commission decisions? To what extent would you say low income customers, um, households, folks in rural communities, how have they actually participated in that, benefited or been harmed? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked me that question, Catalina, and particularly after um, both Camille and Alvaro's comments. Um, first, you know, as Camille said, language really matters. How, how, how you're defining things definitely matters. Um, the fact that North Carolina has a 70% target to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the production of electricity by 2030 is a really terrific goal. goal. How we get there, though, matters. And the absence of any focus or, or intentionality in the language around making that transition equitable or the distributive aspects of making that transition happen um, is sort of how we end up with policies that are focused on large centralized plants, less focused on distributed generation. Um, and so actually, North Carolina was second behind California um, in terms of renewable energy generation for some time. Um, we are a leader actually in renewable energy generation. And um, there again, it is sort of, but how is it done? Um, what is the distributive aspect? What is the impact of um, deploying renewable energy generation in a way that actually has meaningful benefit for, for everyday people. Um, and that's where that intentional, intentionality in the language really matters. Um, California has been intentional about putting in place certain programs, collecting certain data, ensuring certain processes are in place when, the, when renewable energy is deployed. North Carolina does not have that. And in fact, what we had was more of an emphasis on larger scale plants. For a time, North Carolina offered a state tax credit uh, for developers to, to, to build solar energy. Uh, but in order to access that tax credit, first of all, you've got to have an, a certain amount of income um, liability. And then secondly, we we were incentivizing large ever larger systems and not for folks at the household level. So the folks who actually benefit from the tax credit is the utility and not the household, not the family. So if we begin with the question at the legislature, let's how do we put in place policies that result in direct meaningful benefit for households, then maybe we can begin to see programs that follow that goal, as opposed to simply calling it clean energy and doing the same thing that we've always done, or talking about a greenhouse gas reduction target and it's still not benefiting the household. And, and even in the context of ever increasing rates by the utility. Um, we're at the same time we are talking about double digit rate increases. When we know that there is a technology available that could actually save folks money. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Ajulo, for that response. Um, so I have just two quick, more directed questions, one for you, Camille, and one for Alvaro, and then we can respond to some of the questions that have come through the Q&A. Um, so Camille, you've laid out a, a lot of the, the landscape in Louisiana. Um, you participated um, actively in the um, governor's task force um, for climate, um, and can you help us just a understand a little bit more um, what are how are advocates in Louisiana responding to the fact that we still have a there's still a Republican legislature in Louisiana 
the fossil fuel industry in Louisiana, like you described, still has an outsized influence. Can you describe how advocates can respond to those challenges um, and where could momentum come from for something like a just transition? Um, yeah, I, but I would say that um, we've always been led by mostly by Republican um, um, elected officials, and we will be moving into most likely a, a super majority Republican um, um, elected officials, you know, next year with uh, at the at, at the administration level within the House within the Senate and so um, and, and this is a place where we have built an extractive economy um, since the, you know, <clears throat> early century of you know, 1911 through 17 was just really the, the, the start of really uh, beginning to extract the minerals um, and export that. And so it's in Louisiana, we have built this culture around this extractive economy on oil, gas, petrochemicals, and fisheries. And so um, the transition means a lot. It means something different to us here. Um, and, and we need to collectively understand what, what that is for all parties, um, because uh, we, we could be looking at a place where we have stranded assets if, if we um, don't do this right. Um, so I'd also just like to say there are, you know, we're getting visits from uh, European presidents and prime ministers. Uh, there's been, you know, focus on opening up more oil and gas reserves and ex um, drilling expansion, you know, all also, you know, lead it, led by the Biden administration. Um, and so there are national and international global larger demands um, being put on Louisiana and uh, Louisiana is responding how it has um, as in its uh, idea and um, cultural um, narrative of being an energy state. And so we're seeing a lot of push and pull on the conversations around um, carbon capture, utilization and storage where we're seeing a lot more advocates and groups and community residents and elected leaders come pushing back and asking questions. We've seen a lot of pushback on solar as well. Um, and, and so there's just, you know, all of these new technologies and the IRA and the, the BIL has just really pushed to, you know, deploy and make it all happen very quickly, but we, we haven't had the time to adequately study and cite and uh, educate and bring people along and develop the appropriate policies. And so I, I do have, you know, fears that we will, um, we, we are responding to a timeline and a set of um, incentives and resources that have been put out there at the national level. And no one is ready for all of this just yet. And so our grid's not ready. You know, there's just so much work to be done. Uh, so I'm grateful for all the outside uh, support and philanthropic support, especially that is fueling and supporting our, our ground or our, our um, organizations that are on the ground, focusing on equity, focusing on justice, um, asking the hard questions, um, pushing the conversation. Uh, we are, are doing that and also in different ways. For example, we are uh, leading a cohort of Republican state uh, legislators to Rhode Island to visit the Block Island Wind Farm uh, in just two weeks. And, uh, you know, we really want to make sure that we meet people where they are and we do our homework on best practices, lessons learned, we connect peers, we bring our Republican or Democrat, uh, Democratic legislators and, and elected officials along. Uh, and, and again, you know, our focus, we are really, we are really trying to open up the space for offshore wind, um, and, and, and diving into what wind potential looks like for Louisiana, because to me, I think it's the largest linchpin 
Um, 80% of the oil and gas workforce are transferable skills to offshore wind energy. Louisiana companies are who built the first seven wind turbines that are situated in, um, in or that are in the United States and Rhode Island and Virginia. Um, we just built the first large ship. Um, we are building wind turbines um, at an old uh, shipyard. And so we, we, I, I really believe that we can open up the doors uh, for a larger and more and definitely more just transition um, around wind. So that just as one example uh, for that. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Camille. It's good to hear that there's some opportunities there. I think those are some of the challenges that folks in a lot of other states are also confronting. Um, so Alvaro, last question is for you. Um, you know, as we went through the index, you know, as the climate justice index detailed, certainly as you laid out, there's a lot that California has already done. We've already set the, the ambitious goals. We've already created programs. We already have many agencies involved. What more can California do to improve its efforts to center equity? Um, well, I mean, I think it must address uh it must address the inequities that are inherent in the way that we live um, in the California. So this is where climate policy uh, is now, all policies are climate policies. So I actually appreciate that in the last couple of years, um, the governor has really kind of come out to say like housing policy is climate policy, right? Uh, it's talked about, um, you know, employment being climate policy uh, because all of these things are interwoven. And the reason why I'm connecting it to uh, the severe disparities that we still, we still see uh, in the state is that as been, uh, has been described already, there are many things that are coming up with the climate impacts that um, are gonna exacerbate those disparities that we already see in communities. And we are not quite addressing those disparities uh, at the speed that we need to, in order to ensure that everybody's able to transition to adjust um, you know, to a clean energy economy. Uh, and in fact, I think we won't meet our goals if everyone is not able to get to those clean energy uh, economies. So for example, uh, Ajulo talked about clean energy technology. If folks are not able to afford the improvements that are needed in order to actually adopt those clean energy technologies, we are not gonna meet our climate goals. And if folks don't have the employment uh, or the housing security or the financial means to be able to do that work, then we can't get there with only a segment of the population. Yeah. Um, you know, things like uh, climate adaptation and resilience we were just talking about, uh, we are doing a lot of work around climate finance. Some of the biggest insurers uh, in the country just recently announced that they will no longer be insuring home, homes in California due to their wildfire risk. That's a huge issue that we need to continue to see. How is that gonna impact the ability to folks to um, secure their intergenerational wealth that they've been able to build out of their homes uh, if they can no longer insure them because of climate risks? Uh, that's gonna prove a huge issue for a lot of people especially for people who have just gained access to, uh, to home ownership, perhaps because they bought in places that were more susceptible to fire risk or other climate impacts. Uh, so that's a huge uh, issue around the racial wealth gap. Um, so I think the state of California has really been focused on GH3 redu GHG reductions, the clean energy transition, bringing on re more renewable energy, great things, things that I support and things that the organization supports, absolutely. But we now really need to do the hard job of making sure that this is a multi-benefit strategy, more intersectional, so that we address multiple issues that people are facing at the same time. And we don't focus blindly on one issue while all of the other issues around it are just getting worse and worse. I know that that's a hard job, but that's, I think, the job that we have in front of us. And that's why people are so, I think, um, overwhelmed with the climate challenge, because it's not just about the climate impact that people are feeling, but it's about all of the other associated things that are happening around them uh, that are making the situation even worse. Um, so we have a lot of work to do here in the state. It's a good state to work in. It's a good place to do all of this work, because at least there's an opportunity to try to do these things, uh, but the challenge is still really great. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you. To close this out, I'm just looking at some of the questions that have come, come through the Q&A and I'm gonna do my best here to just pose a question to you all um, and feel free to also add any other closing thoughts that you have. Um, but there's questions about, um, what can we do to raise more awareness among younger generations, Gen Z? What about them? Like they're huge stakeholders in our states. Um, you know, what about, you know, centering justice more broadly beyond just climate, beyond just these 
cur like current funding opportunities um, so that we're not doing this like two steps forward, three steps back um, kind of dynamic. Um, so I guess to, to tie that all in, just who needs to be, who needs to participate? Like who do we need to see um, engage in this process um, and who needs to, um, who needs to come to the table? Um, I can just um, shed a little light because um, my organization is built on the belief and the power of planning and bringing everybody under the tent and, and looking at the data, looking at the, the trends and, and creating scenarios and, and ensuring that everybody has a, a voice in that and, and creating a roadmap. And, and so I'm really excited because um, there's a lot of activity and, and people coalescing around um, values that they share and they are strategizing together and they are um, making a lot of movement. And so uh, we all have the power to make change. Um, it's, it's really finding our partnership, um, le leading with our heart uh, and, and, you know, just I could sit back and say, oh, well, this is the way things are going to be. And, and, but, but no, we can't do that. This, you know, I'm a mile away from Exxon. I live in the industrial corridor. Um, I know the, the air quality that my, um, my children are exposed to. Uh, and, and I am going to, I'm in Louisiana. I'm on the ground. I'm on the front lines and I, I want to fight for a very different future. And, and that's what I'm committed to. So my organization is trying to do everything that it can to make sure that people actually get to access these resources um, that you know, exactly as the other panelists have said, uh, the programs aren't designed to actually go out in the community and provide the technical assistance, the outreach, the education to actually homeowners that, and low income and moderate income families to, to even know these resources exist. And so we are, we've just created the first Louisiana State Green Bank, the Louisiana Clean Energy Fund to, um, to try to start providing different financing options and do that legwork at the community level. Um, we are producing model tools and policies to, to get out into the community to support, um, to support change and, and opening up opportunities around renewable energy. And so I think for all of us, um, we, we've got to find our outlets, we have to find our partners, and we can make big shifts and waves, but uh, it's, got, we, you know, it's not, it's not going to be easy, and, um, and we shouldn't expect it to be, and so we've got to put the work in. And, and I'm just um, grateful to be part of the conversation, and I've loved listening to the, the panelists, so thank you. Thank you so much. Ajulo, closing thoughts, response? Yeah, just two. Um, first, you know, because we're using public dollars, I think it is totally fair and a requirement actually that we ask the question who benefits from the investment. And so let's continue to ask that question wherever we have um, a, a stage of, of any sort. And then secondly, um, the utilities are critical to this, and hopefully um, in some places they will be more open to um, sort of collaboratively thinking about how this transition happens. But if not, um, let's continue to keep them as a focus of our advocacy. Thank you. Alvaro, to close this out. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation to join. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, I took the, the liberty of answering some questions on the chat. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, all hands on deck, right? Everyone has to be involved. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that we're doing a lot in the organization is trying to connect the dots between the issues that communities face that are not climate related. But they are, because ultimately they're going to be impacted by climate. So we have this program called Greenlining the Block where we are actively working with community partners in community to connect the dots, providing with the capacity needed to be able to pursue resources to make changes in their neighborhoods and to identify ways that we can incubate practices and laws that will make it easier for the next time that there is a generational opportunity to make change, to have that be more accessible to people. We're, for us, we're already looking at the next time. Yes, IRA and what we did now is important, 
it's not enough. We need it to be done every year for probably the next 20 years to do it right. Um, so that's the level of the kind of challenge that we have ahead of us. So we're already thinking, how do we improve on the next time that we have an opportunity to pass something like this? And how do we make it easier and more accessible? And how do we ultimately, to Julia's point, make sure that the benefits accrue to the people that need them the most? Thank you all so much. Um, with that, um, as you can see, we've come to the end of our hour. I just want to thank everyone in the audience who tuned in, um, stayed with us, or those who will be tuning in later. Um, and to our amazing panelists, Alvaro, Camille, Ajulo, thank you so much for the work that you're doing, that you're leading in your state, and for sharing your experiences and the issues that you're confronting today. Um, I want to encourage folks to learn more about the information we covered today, check out some of the resources we dropped in the chat. Um, we will also be following up um, to share additional resources, um, the slides from this from this record, the recording uh, YouTube link, um, as well as a report on carbon capture um, and storage, which the center released yesterday. We also have a new um, primer on energy democracy, which lays out the main topics um, and themes that we're dealing with. Um, thank you all so much. Be well, everyone. Take care.